Hello and welcome to the Jesus Seminar. We have been looking for Jesus for quite a while now, and we haven't found him yet. I'm not talking about the Jesus that you find in your Bibles, but I'm talking about the true Jesus, the historical Jesus. After we have learned about how reliable the Gospels really are in terms of when we date them, how many copies there were, how much fits archeologically. Now let's ask the question, is there any group that disagrees with the reliability of the gospels? The answer is, I'm looking for Jesus right now in the text of this book called the Holy Bible. I'm not finding where he is. Turns out you can't trust what the Bible says. Anything that is in there we know is just not trustworthy. Throw it out. After throwing out the earliest records about Jesus that we find in the Bible, which of course is completely untrustworthy, what can we then know about Jesus of Nazareth? Well, here are our conclusions. Jesus of Nazareth was born sometime during the reign of Herod the Great. His mother was named Mary, and Joseph may have been his human father. The Holy Spirit, was that's not possible. And who knows, maybe Jesus' dad was a traveling soldier. That sort of thing happens, you know. He was born in Nazareth, definitely not in Bethlehem, because that's just silly. Jesus was a sage who wandered around talking about, you know, a kingdom of heaven, and he had some sort of a messianic con complex, but he did say some nice things. He practiced healing, this is true, but it's all the matter of suggestion. Just watch this guy. Now, do you think those people are really healed? No, it's all suggestion. That's how Jesus was. I interrupt this nonsense for a moment of orthodoxy from the gospel according to St. Luke. And the angel said unto them, For behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Jesus did not walk on water. He did not feed the multitudes. He did not raise Lazarus from the dead. He never changed water into wine. How do we know this? Because that is impossible. He was arrested in Jerusalem and crucified by the Romans. He was an obnoxious person, so they just got rid of him. Um, and when it comes to the situation of an empty tomb, that is that Jesus rose from the grave. Now, firstly, we know a couple different things. People don't raise from the dead. Therefore, Jesus could not have possibly risen from the dead. And now for a moment of orthodoxy from St. Paul. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, and you are in your sins. Then they also who are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we of all men are the most miserable. But now hath Christ arisen. So Jesus was not raised bodily from the dead. It does not matter that if this was a believable thing, this would be the most attested to event in the entire ancient world. That does not matter. The resurrection accounts are probably based on the emotions of women, like Mary Magdalene. For a while, they thought she had seven demons. They got those out, and then all of a sudden, she's seen resurrections. Let's talk about the topic of hell. Take it away, John Shelby. I don't think hell exists. I happen to believe in life after death, but I don't think it's got a thing to do with reward and punishment. Religion is always in the control business. Uh, and that's something people don't really understand. It's, it's in the guilt-producing control business. And if you have heaven, 
as a place where you're rewarded for your goodness and hell as a place where you're punished for your evil, then you sort of have control of the population. And so they create this fiery place, which has quite literally scared the hell out of a lot of people throughout Christian history. I think the church fired its furnaces hotter than anybody else. <clears throat> but I think there's a sense in most religious life of, of reward and punishment in some form. The church doesn't like for people to grow up because you can't control grown-ups. That's why we talk about being born again. When you're born again, you're still a child. The people don't need to be born again. They need to grow up. They need to accept their responsibility for themselves and the world. What do you make of the theology, which uh, is pretty quite prominent these days in America, which is that there is one guaranteed way not to go to hell, and that is to accept Jesus as your personal Savior? Yeah, I grew up in that tradition. Uh, every church I know claims that we are the true church. And they have some ultimate authority. We have the infallible Pope. We have the inerrant Bible. The idea that the truth of God can be bound in any human system, by any human creed, by any human book, is almost beyond imagination for me. I mean, God is not a Christian. God is not a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist. All of those are human systems which human beings have created to try to help us walk into the mystery of God. I honor my tradition. I walk through my tradition. But I don't believe my tradition defines God. I think it only points me to God. You and I are emerging people, not fallen people. Our problem is not that we are born in sin. Our problem is we do not yet know how to achieve being fully human. The function of the Christ is not to rescue the sinners, but to empower you and to call you to be more deeply and fully human than you've ever realized there was the potential within you to be. Maybe salvation needs to be conveyed in terms of enhancing your humanity rather than rescuing you from it. Life is a startling and wondrous experience. And eventually, I think we're going to discover that God is unfolding through the life of our consciousness and our self-consciousness and is not a parent figure up in the sky. Now, John Shelby Spong is not a part of the Jesus Seminar. You should know that. He's just a good, faithful, Episcopal bishop. John Dominic Grasson, on the other hand, well, he is a member of the Jesus Seminar. What I'm proposing in this book, in a way, flies in the face of common sense. Anyone who reads Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sees immediately that the story really holds together very well. It could easily, very easily, be made into a passion play, as it has so often been done. Despite the differences, the story holds together. And you have four accounts. Leave out the Gospel of Peter for the moment. So what's your problem? Here, surely, at least, we have the story hour by hour, blow by blow, word by word. To suggest anything else seems weird. What I'm suggesting is precisely something else. Here, these are the big questions. Remember this story. Nobody else seems to know the details of this story. Now, I'm not talking about the brute facts that Jesus was crucified, that Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, that Jesus was crucified with some conjunction probably of Jewish authority and Roman authority in some relationship to the Paschal feast. That I would probably take as historically quite sure. You have, you have it in general in Tacitus, you have it in general in Josephus. There was a movement, the founder was killed, but the movement continued. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the details. The who spat in Jesus' face. The what did the high priest say? What did Jesus say? What did Pilate say? That's what I'm talking about. Nobody mentions any of those details anywhere outside that stream of tradition in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A new hypothesis. What if basically the first followers of Jesus knew almost nothing about what had happened and were not interested in going around to see if they could find out what happened, but were very, very interested in finding out, was this all in the hands of God? Was the crucifixion of Jesus a sign that God had abandoned Jesus? And was the, 
and was the fear not that the Romans might come after them, but God might come after them. So where else could you go to find out if this was all in the hands of God except into your tradition? And of course you know what you're looking for. You're looking for anything in your tradition that says, yes, the righteous suffer. And of course you don't have to look very far in the Christian Old Testament to find out that that's almost like a job description of the righteous. The righteous <laughs> suffer and they are still the righteous. So that is basically my argument that behind this narrative that we have is layers of Old Testament texts which at a certain point, and that we'll have to come into in more detail later, is put into a narrative story. It was not there from the beginning. So that literally when Paul says in the 50s that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and rose on the third day according to the scriptures, he's not thinking of a story, but he's thinking of a lot of scriptures. And the good news about this, because I've been looking all over the place for the real historical Jesus, and I have found it in the five Gospels by the Jesus Seminar. And I now can pray the Lord's Prayer with assurance of knowing what Jesus actually said. We voted on it with beads in Corvallis. Lots of beads in Corvallis, Oregon. Marcus Borg is professor there. The only thing that we can know for sure that Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer is our Father. And how do we know that he would say this? Because he was sexist. He may have said, your name be reverend. He may have said, impose your imperial rule. He may have said, provide us with daily bread. He may have said, forgive us our debts to the extent that we've forgiven those who are in debt to us. But the rest of it, he definitely did not say. I'm positive of it. I want to take you on this exciting journey with me in the Jesus Seminar so it will help us to devise a Christianity that will be palatable for the generations to come. So guys, what do we make of this liberal scholarship from the Jesus Seminar and from other places as well? Well, I think that the clip from John Dominic Crisson explains it best of all. How does one really do away with the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ in a way that makes sense? They start from a place that says it's not possible for a resurrection to actually happen. And so how does one actually go about explaining the growth of the Christian movement? It's almost impossible. You really do have to come up with a theory like John Dominic Crisson does, which says something along the lines of there was a guy named Jesus, no one really knew him very closely or personally. He gets killed, and then his followers, kind of from a distance, have to come up with some sort of story to make sense of his death. And they do this with this myth called the resurrection. To believe that someone like a Paul or a James or really even any of the disciples were willing to give up their lives for this belief in a guy whom they really didn't didn't have any personal contact with, in a guy who whose story is so fantastical, uh, but even so they're willing to give up everything. It's just a really um, challenging argument to make, but that's where they have to go. They have to go to make that argument. Otherwise, what do you have? You have uh, a event that is attested to by multiple individuals for which these individuals later go on and give up their lives. That doesn't make any sense if they know the truth. And so you have to create a narrative where those apostles, those disciples, don't know the truth. And only then does it make sense that they're willing to go so far as to give up everything. What do we make of this? Well, mainly, let me reiterate that if the resurrection account is true, it is the single most historically verifiable event in the ancient world. The accounts in the Holy Scriptures, and then of course beyond the Holy Scriptures in the accounts of people like Tacitus and Josephus, and then even of course the other early Christians. And yes, the Jesus Seminar really did vote on the words of Jesus with beads. Okay, we'll see you next time. Look at this.
bunch of Missouri Synod Lutheran nonsense. I hate Lutherans, especially real ones.